My name is uh, Vahan Davudia. Sorry, I have to sit because I have to demonstrate this kind of law. And I'm a physics experimentalist for 30 years. And in fact, today I don't have a theory. These are facts. So far, I have already uploaded 36 theories in the last six months YouTube. That was great success, as some people called, emailed me, and uh, you know, I appreciate that. They loved it because it was a unique experiment I have never seen in any books anyway. So, and uh, today, in fact, it's all my observation in the last 30 years. And because they're, you know, small and short, like one minute and some of them even less or more, so I decided not to have one video for each one. So I decided to combine them all together. I had like 60 concepts in science, so I chose only 35 of them, the good ones. And then in three parts, I did already one part, this is going to be the second part. And I'm hoping by the time I finish everything, you guys can learn a lot. These are laws of physics that every day in our life, in routine, in ordinary life, we encounter with them. We do knowingly and unknowingly, we do these laws of physics and then we don't pay attention. Because I'm a meticulous person, always I scrutinize these things. And when I was so young, I remember this is the way I started. I had to analyze everything. And that is the reason why I learned. Because when you analyze something, you don't know the answer, you go after that, you will find it. And guess what, at that time there was no Google, nothing, all we had to do, go to the library. But nowadays, you guys are so lucky, you have everything at your disposal. You have Google, you have YouTube, you have so many other things. The technology is beyond my imagination. So it's so good that you guys have everything. And first of all, i like to thank uh, YouTube for having this fantastic opportunity for us so we can upload our videos, some other people can upload their videos and we learn from one another and that's amazing. YouTube does fantastic job. It's like a comprehensive huge network that's connecting everyone. It doesn't matter what your theories are, what your thoughts are, it's the physics, chemistry or whatever. People can watch if they like it, you know, they can support it. But overall, YouTube is providing this opportunity. And in my opinion, YouTube is like a huge university, free university, everyone can join. There is no limitation whatsoever. You don't have to be genius. You don't have to be educated. So all you have to do is just upload your videos and the chances are people might love it. Well, anyway, I am not here to teach geology or geography or physics or biology or other things. All I'm here to show you the small laws of physics we do every day and then whole my life I observed them and then I took some notes so I want to convey everything to you by the time I finish these three I mean uh, parts you will see how much you learn because these are the laws of physics you do every day in your life so the bottom line is I want to you know Activate your sense of wonder. I remember Albert Einstein, dad was a smart person. He was in an electrical uh, shop and so and so. One time he came home, he gave Albert Einstein compass. And he was a young boy. And imagine, it activated Albert Einstein's uh, sense of wonder. He was playing with that compass all day long. Why this is going north is not going south? Why is going north south, north south? Why you change the orientation? It just orient itself. So that is the reason why Albert Einstein started analyzing things when he was maybe seven, eight years old. And that, that is the way they learn. I also heard that, you know, Wright brothers, they were bike mechanics. And imagine, mechanics are smart people. I mean, they know exactly how to find the problem and then solve the problem and then fix the problem. 
And one day I remember the dad came over, they brought a toy. I have no idea what that toy was. And imagine how smart he was. And the mom was also an educated person, but the dad did that on purpose. So he brought a toy. So tell them, Wilbur and the other brother, you take them apart, but make sure you have to be able to put it back together. Well, you know what? I think that did not tell them the secret how you do it, but you know what? They learned. And that is the way when I was six, seven years old, I remember when we had toys, there was no made in China, everything was made in Hong Kong. And I remember I used to ask my brother, what is this electric motor? He said, everything is it with electric motor. We had gears, we had like toys, and then we should take it apart, but we had no idea how to put it back. Because at that time, I had no idea how to do that. Well, of course, I will explain in if two minutes that you know when I was seventh grade I had a friend his dad was mechanic and then we used to go there and then learn a lot from him it was on Fridays that we had no school anyway so now I start this and in fact I came up with a unique title for my concert I mean for my uh, observations and you know the title is how to learn laws of physics in streets and sometimes you may wonder can I do that can I learn laws of physics in the street yes you can I remember that is the way I learned well of course you know I had extensive courses and so and so and my best friend was books and God knows all my life I spent it in Barnes and Noble probably last 25 years. I was in Barnes and Noble maybe five, six, seven hours a day. And then it was so famous. They said, Juan, we don't have to find you in a bar. We come over in Barnes and Noble, you're drinking coffee and studying laws of physics. And that's the way I did. So I start this uh, how to learn laws of physics in streets. Imagine airplane is amazing. I did explain so many in my previous theories and I always was fascinated when I was in airport, I was watching. And I remember I was a little boy and then we went to buy some spare parts and then my dad told me you have to buy shock absorber. I said, what is shock absorber? And then he showed me I had no idea. And then he did explain, my dad was a good mechanic also. He said, if you don't have a shock absorber, the spring will kill you. You go up, up and down, up and down. And then I realized shock absorber is an amazing device. We have the same thing in our knees, on our elbows. When we jump down, it's shocking the absorb because the force is not. And then I realized he was right. And then I was watching every time I would see a airplane is landing, I would watch those huge I mean shock absorber and imagine some airplanes are like 747, 152 tons to 252 tons. I mean isn't that amazing? There is no way you have to stop an airplane because all that kinetic energy you just bump it on the you know, floor so it has to be able to absorb the shock. It looks like you know if you're jumping from 20 meters high and then there is no water in a pool you're going to get damaged you're going to get so injured but if there is a water in a pool what happened the water is absorbing your shock so you go maybe few meters down and then you come up so that is the advantage of uh, i mean having uh, the you know shock absorber this one is so amazing. Uh, you know, whole my life I have uh, studied, you know, books and physics and so and so, but I can see some people are unique. Unique, I mean that they are observant. You know, some people, they see something and then they pass by. They don't analyze it. In my opinion, if you want to learn any laws of physics, chemistry, geology, geometry, 
everything. You have to be observant. You have to scrutinize. Why? Albert Einstein once said that it was amazing. We are like babies. He was right. Always we ask why. And then sometimes we hear the you know, answer, but we don't pay attention what the answer was. So imagine why some people are so observant. And I start with like 2,000 years ago, and then uh, like Alessandria is an amazing city at that time. They had university, imagine 2,000 years ago. Archimedes was engineer in that university, and that was just, uh, it looks like there was a civilization only in that town. And uh, his name was Setebius, and he was the one who invented the water clock. But imagine millions of people passed by because uh, Setebius uses dad was a barber, and then one time he was going to his dad, you know, to see what he's doing, and all of a sudden he stopped. There was a, you know, like a, a rock. I mean, it was like a cliff or something like that, and he saw it was, a, you know, dripping water. He said, hey, this is amazing. This can be a clock. And, you know, his mind was so prepared, and then he came home, he made a big container, and then he made a water clock. And then uh, the poor man at that time, they had no idea, there's atmospheric pressure, there's a pressure for the water, the more water you have, the more pressure you have. They didn't know laws of physics. But imagine how smart he was, he inspired by those dripping water, and it was the gravity, because it was seeping through the, uh, you know, rocks, and it was perfect timing. And then he built that, but later some of the people came smarter, they just, uh, I mean, improved it so much good. But this is the way they started. They had clock. And imagine they had to wait till 17th century, and then Christian Hugo, and then Galileo uh, in 16th century, and then the pendulum was, which was the most important thing in the history of mankind. Pendulum was invented. But imagine, Setebius was so good. And there's another person, Galileo. I mean, how many people you have seen, they go to church. They go to the Mass, and then, then some days they worship and come home. But this man was genius. I mean, he was genius, which history has not seen anyone like Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton, because they're observing everything. And then he was in medical school two years, and then one time he was in, you know, um, pizza, cathedral, or the church, and then he saw that monk pull the chandelier and let it go, and then he realized that chandelier is swinging back and forth. How genius he was. He said, this is the time. I can get a time and imagine. How genius he was, there was no clock, nothing was important. But because he was in medical school, he took his pulse. And then he realizes that, you know, the small swing is exactly like a big swing. He went home and then the pendulum was discovered. And imagine pendulum is so important in our life because 17th century people were getting like, you know, time. It was off like two or three hours. But in 17th century, when Christian Hugo came over and finished everything, it was one minute. It was fantastic. So Galileo realized that, you know, this is amazing. That can be, and then he got the laws of motion. In fact, when Galileo came, he paved the road for the Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton was genius. But imagine when Sir Isaac Newton came over, the stage was set for him. So he had to start from the second law and the third law because Galileo did that. But what I mean, so many people see the chandelier and Galileo was the only one who see that. And then there was another case, like Archimedes. How many people, millions of people take a shower? And why 
I mean, he called Eureka, Eureka, because, you know, he was genius. He was taken aback and then he realized the gravity is not affecting Gorjka, you know, the gravity is not, not, he's floating in water. And then buoyancy, which is so important, and imagine all these ships, entire world is so important, that laws of, and then he discovered that. And then he said, Eureka, Eureka, I found it. Let's see who else. Like uh, one great scientist, his name was Democritus. And he was like 2000 years ago. I mean, these guys were not ordinary human beings. I mean, how could you talk about atom? 2000 years ago, that was genius. I mean, he said, it's atomos, it means uncountable. He says, Democritus said, if you want to see how the universe works, you have to see the smallest particle or smallest, you know, thing in the world. And he called it atomos. Or in other words, it was a good analogy, uncountable atomos. And then it became atom. And imagine 2000 years ago, it would take another 2000 years, and then people would get electron, proton, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then, okay. Like James Watt was another person. And before James Watt, it's amazing, people had no idea about the efficiency. In French, they call it rendement, which is the same thing. And then, guess what? The engine, I mean, um, the. What was that called? Let me see. Sometimes, yeah, at that time, combustion engine was not there. And then what happened, Mr. James Watt came over, a newcomer had already invented the steam engine, but unfortunately they had no idea, they wasted so much, because they had no idea about the efficiency and so and so, you may be surprised I tell you it was only 3%. But James Watt was a mechanical engineer. He came over, he said, instead of cooling that, I have to get that cooling chamber outside somewhere else. We can cool everything and then he improved that so good. So, I mean, so many people saw that but they had no idea. But James Watt saw that and then he solved the problem. Let's see who is okay. Sometimes, you know, we do laws of physics. Let's say you have a cup of coffee and then you put it in a microwave and then uh, you said, uh, brother, mom, dad, it's hot, we can have it now. So practically it's like 88 degrees or something like that. And then you get that uh, glass or sometimes it's like, you know, ceramic or some other things or sometimes even plastic and then you realize that the glass is not as hot as water. Do you ever think why? Because I remember when I used to work I discovered that is so amazing. It has to do which one of your food has water, more water. The water molecules are polar so that's why they're getting more hot. So I remember one time I had rice, I had a stew, I had some other things, and then I had to get a real good, I mean, meter, you know, because it's infrared, so you don't have to touch it, you can do it from the, you know, like 10, 20, 30 centimeters, and then I measured, and then I realized rice is not that hot, and then I, Research, research, I realized that is the reason why the more water is in the food, the more they get hot. Because some people, you know, say, well, when you put it in a microwave oven, it's getting hot. But you have to scrutinize. You have to analyze why. So because they're polar, that's why. See, every time you put something in a microwave oven, and then what happened? That 14 gigahertz 
is aligning everything, is going to angular acceleration. It's exactly like, you know, you have a magnet and then you put it somewhere, they just align everything. So that is the way you learn. I mean, next time you put it in a microwave oven and say, oh, let me see which one has more water. And then you learn. And then you will never forget. That is how easy it is. This is so amazing. Uh, in, the, in fact, a uh, few months ago I had for because my great inspiration also came from nature, animals, and uh, insects. And I remember, I, uh, I, yeah, I remember I uh, uh, compared uh, airplane with geese. Because I used to live in Denver, Colorado, and the wildlife was amazing there for 18 years. And one time I realized that, you know, exactly this is doing like a roll, pitch, and yaw. It's exactly like airplane. And that was great success. People called me, they emailed me, they loved that. And I have it, vahandavudyanet.com. And the topic is like this, uh, aerodynamic of airplane compared with birds. And that was amazing. And imagine, how could you see how the airplane works? See how easy it is. This is a piece of paper. So what you have to do, Blow on top, see? See what happened? When I'm blowing on top, here, I'm creating partial vacuum. And Mr. Daniel Bernoulli was a great scientist. He discovered this. Then imagine your airplane, like this, is airful. It's exactly like birds, see? It's going much faster here, much slower here, see, and then it's creating lift. That is the way you learn, and this is the way the airplane works. It doesn't matter how complicated things are, but see how it is? You can demonstrate that by a piece of paper, you blow on it, what happens? The paper goes up. The reason why, because, see, the pressure is low here, and the atmospheric pressure is here. Pressure like that, see? And uh, this one is about mechanic shop and you know I'm so happy that uh, you know I was seventh grade and then my uh, my friend uh, we were 13 years old almost and then I remember his dad was fantastic mechanic and then he would tell me Vaughn let's go on Fridays because we had no schools on Friday anyway go to my dad's shop and then we'll learn and that was a great moment in my life because my dad was also not mechanic, but he knew about the, you know engines and the diesel engines and some other things. He was a technical man anyway. And then I went with my friend and that, uh, you know, his dad was a very good person. He said, boys, come over, I want to show you something. And I don't know why. I mean, I remember the exact circumstances. And he said, we're overhauling something. I said, what is overhaul? He said, we're repairing. Repair is different, overhaul is different. We have to change everything, ring, piston, crankshaft, all the way, because this is an old engine. And then I said, so how do you know how to do this? And he said, my son, my friend, let me tell you, every time, first, comes last, last comes first. I didn't understand. He said, when you open a bolt, that comes first. And then you open another component, second, third. But you have to be able to put it in a line. And it doesn't matter. If I'm sick and then my helper come over, he knows how to put them back. And imagine that was a great moment in my life because I learned it's a rule of, it's a golden rule. When you open something, if you put it in a row, there is no way that you can make a mistake. And next time, you can start from the end, 
go to the front. So this was so good and in fact uh, in my whole life I did assembling, disassembling. I had no idea how this works and then when I disassemble things I realized oh this is the way it works. How do you expect a doctor or a surgeon to know about the humans, they have all kind of, you know, the pictures and so and so and so. They won't be able to tell you how to do the surgery. But they have cadaveral and then they open, they dissect everything, okay, this is the, you know, uh, stomach, this is intestine, this is kidney and so and so and so. You touch it and then you learn it. Mechanics are like that, exactly like that. So, and then I realized, he was absolutely right. When I grew up, went to you know United States, and then I studied electronics, and then I remember we had a friend there. Uh, he was anthropologist, and then I learned about a lot from him. I realized anthropologists are amazing people, and uh, you know when it was like World War, old World War, something like that, the, you know the airplanes would. Uh, crash and so and so, the enemies would get that airplane and then do reverse engineering. And the anthropologist told me, Vaughan, this is exactly what we're doing. If you see a dead person, it's just rotten, there's nothing left but the bones, you won't be able to tell it's a man, woman, it's young, old or what, but this is our job, we are anthropologists. We can tell the sex, we can tell how old he was, we can even tell how he, he died, he or she died. So they can go back and reverse engineering. So that mechanic, he was not an educated person, but by experience he knew that, you know, Vaughan, first come last, last come first. And uh, this is my favorite rocks. What I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, you pick up something. The reason why you learn, say, like, you know, like this rock. I love fishing, I love going out. When you pick up something like this, say, wow, why is round? Did anyone? Did machine shop on this? No. The machine shop is the river. So this tumbled in a river maybe millions of times. And then sometimes you can see one part is more, you know, worn out and one side is not. And then you realize there's more granite here. There's less granite here. And sometimes you can even see like this and then you should ask, why a rock is like this? See, you see? And then you realize millions, billions of years ago, this was underneath. So what happened, layers and layers and layers came, and this is a different material. See, this is a different rock, and then there was another one came on top of it. So you can realize why this rock has two colors. See, like this one, the crystals are so huge. You can see how big it is. This is silicon, which is so important in our life. Well, in fact, uh, rocks are three types. I don't want to teach geology or anything like that. The first, we call it, you know, uh, sedimentary rocks, which, you know, the last layer, they're not real hard like this one. They are hard, but not as good as the other one. And, you know, uh, then the other layer is called igneous rocks, or it's in their language is called fiery. And guess what? They are magnetic. Let me show you. This is neodymium. Let me see. Wow, you can't even take it. See? They're magnetic. Look. See? See? They're magnetic because there's an iron on this. And then the igneous rock are so hard, so hard. And then after that, we have metamorphic. Meta is a Latin word, means change. Metamorphic means, you know, sometimes igneous rock change to, you know, like, uh, I mean, uh, sedimentary and, you know, the other things. But overall, you know, the pressure 
and the heat always changes everything. So this is the way you learn. If you don't realize why this rock is so sharp over here, because it tumbled in a river, but the reason why, you know, this is a harder material. This is like granite, but this part maybe was not granite, was sedimentary, and it was worn out a lot. This is so important in our life. I have to, I have to post this so you can see it. Sometimes it's so amazing how you can learn laws of physics at home. Some you can learn like me in a mechanic shop. Because uh, those days we were not talking about girls or things. All we talk about science, space, and then mechanic things and things like that. And I remember always we were thinking about, you know, science. And imagine how good it is that you know what the mechanical advantage is. And I remember uh, when it was at a mechanic shop and then he showed me flywheel and then I could not even pick that up because that was like uh, 40 kilograms almost. And then he showed me a smaller guild called uh, starter gear. I said, uh, Sir, what is the purpose of a starter gear? He said, my son or my friend, this is mechanical advantage. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you have 10 gears versus 100 gears. So flywheel is 100 gears, 100 teeth, and that starter is 10. And then what you do, you multiply. You have mechanical advantage. And then and it's cold winter time, and then you have like 200, 500 amperes, and then you start the engine. The little can turn the, uh, you know, flywheel, and then the crankshaft, and then you can start your motor. And then I ask him, sir, how about if you go backwards? He said, no, it's impossible. You can't do that. So the mechanical advantage, and I remember at that time, he said, 1 to 10. Now there's some cars, you know, we have like a 10 to 15 or 16. They're more powerful anyway. And one thing, uh, you know, I used to watch always, uh, you know, in Florida, uh, for the, you know, like uh, spaces and things like that. And imagine how important gears are in our life. I have to explain it a few minutes ago, uh, because I have never seen in any book, they say, well, the gears are like this, and then they explain, yeah, we have the ratio here, one, two, three, four to five, and then I had to scrutinize, find the answer. The gears, each cog or each teeth is a lever, and imagine what happened. I remember one time, um, we were in Florida and then we stayed there one week, that was like 30 years ago. And I remember I told my son and my daughter, we have to be here like a week and then we have to see this event because they were launching something. And then we went to this site and that was the best moment in my life. And you see the rocket and, the, and this is the pad. And my son said, why do we have to know this? I said, you know, this is a once in a lifetime. And in Cape Canaveral, we have to see and then watch it. And anyway, we came friend with the one of, you know, those uh, people over there. And then he told me it's 5.5 million pounds. And the amazing thing about this is, you know, this is assembled somewhere else. There is no way that they can assemble on the path. And then they transport it easy, 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 and then they take it over there. In fact, I wrote it here. Let me see where it is. It takes six hours. Let me see. Yeah, it takes six hours. So it is extremely slow. And imagine. My point is here, how could you transport this huge rocket and everything else and booster to the pad so it will fly later? There is no way. The only way you can do that is a mechanical advantage. So the mechanical advantage is what gear? If you have the strongest 
belts, strongest, you know, there's no rope, I mean, chains or everything else is going to snap. There is no way. But imagine that gearbox they are using, and one time I saw in a science channel, long time ago, it was five reduction gear. And imagine how powerful it is. There is no way that you can transport this to the path without the gears. So that's how important the gears are in our life. Because imagine, uh, in ordinary life, you have the, you know, washing machine, dishwasher. If you take them apart, you can see, no matter what, everywhere you can see the gears. Because gears are so good, they're so versatile, in a small space, they can transfer power. Let me see where the other gear is. I have to show you. In fact, uh, when I was in elementary school, Louis Pasteur was my favorite scientist. He was my role model, and then I remember uh, he was genius, and then he was working on a sick worm, and then I was so excited, I bought my own sick worms and then feeding them and so and so and so and so. And then I realized this man was so exceptional and he became a role model and he was so genius. He discovered so many things that, you know, before then people had no idea whatsoever. I mean, how dedicated he was to his life. And I remember I saw, you know, black and white like 38, 40 years ago, you know, two beautiful you know, girls died, it was not negligence or anything because the laws of medical law at that time was not so advanced. And then the poor man was still working in the lab and then wife said, yeah, your daughter died and so and so. And then he would not give up. I mean, that kind of passion, you don't see it nowadays that, you know, people are so dedicated in their life to solve the problem. And uh, I mean, he was an extraordinary person. And then I remember one uh, armor got a huge rock and then threw it on his, uh, you know, like a, uh, it was not a car, it was like, you know, two wheeler or something like that, you know. Uh, and then uh, he kept the car, kept the rock, and then when he solved the problem, he gave it to the Farmer. Oh, the farmer was so ashamed, he was going to die. And then what he did, he was a great person. I got so mad. I said, if I were him, I would throw the rock back and say, no, no, no. He has a great mind. He's a good person, so he solved the problem. But Louis Pasteur overall is a fantastic person. And, you know, I respected him all my life. Uh, and uh, one time he said something, uh, golden rule. He said, chance only favors prepared mind. And I remember he wrote something for uh, Mr. Fleming. That man was, that doctor was genius. He saved the humans, not one, not two millions. And Mr. Fleming was a good doctor in England. He was on vacation. And then uh, uh, one time they said the girl was crying. And then that was a Petri box they called. Petri plate they call it, which is, you know, they can do all kinds of bacteria in it and so and so. And Dr. Fleming came over and realized that, you know, when the girl was crying, you know, the tears fell in that, you know, plate. And that part was nothing. And then he realized that is antibiotic. And then he invented antibiotic. So, I mean, how good he was. I mean, ordinary people could not say why. I mean, if the girl is crying, then there's a, a plate over here, and you know, the bacteria is not growing there. We couldn't tell. And as Louis Pasteur said, his mind was prepared. And I'm glad that this is a golden rule for everything. And then imagine, every time uh, you have something like this, you have to scrutinize it and then uh, learn it. And this last one for this part is uh, so amazing uh, because sometimes some people say, well, 
education is the key. I agree. I made a list over here. The most important one you may not believe. He is so famous. His name is Antoine Lee Van Hoek from Holland. The poor man had no education whatsoever. He was a draper. And imagine, he invented microscope. And uh, I remember there was a book I read, uh, they did not make fun of him, they said he was an assuming scientist. Because nobody was thinking that, you know, a draper and a merchant can invent microscope. And that man was genius. He was grinding lenses all the time, all day long, all day long. And imagine, most I mean, people, they did breakthroughs, they had no education. And when I was a young boy, I used to work, you know, with my brother and then making electric motors. You know, in fact, I did this in a few months ago in my theories. I was 10 years old, I built my own electric motor, DC motor. I still have it. And people loved it because they had never seen such a weird electric motor in their life. Michael Faraday was one of them. The only thing he could read and write, he had no education whatsoever. I mean, how could he become a university professor? How could he become so... I mean, imagine when Galileo discovered that pendulum and Michael Faraday discovered the induction. Our entire life depends on induction. I mean, there is no way Nikola Tesla was another genius after Michael Faraday. But see, Michael Faraday, what happened, he paved the road for Nikola Tesla. And there was another one, he was a good person, an American physicist, Joseph Henry, had no education. And I mentioned that, Mr. Levan Hoke, and Gregor Mandel. Sometimes I get mad for the Nobel Prize uh, people. And imagine Gregor Mandel from Austria, he laid the foundation for the genetic. Imagine how smart he was with the flowers. Now Mr. Francis and Crick, they got the Nobel Prize. And I'm sure if I go back and if I get that part, you know, whatever the film was, they did not mention Gregor Mandel's name because he laid the foundation for the genetics. And I wish they could pay attention and do that. Sir Humphrey Davy, he was a great experimentalist, like me, and I do believe that the experiment is always good. Sir Humphrey Davy did so many mistakes. They said, this is a compound, this is a so and so and so and so. But he was extremely genius. I mean, with dialysis and things like that, he would do everything. And then he discovered so many things. And then Leon Foucault. And the poor man was so afraid of blood and so and so. You know, his mom said, you have to be a doctor. He passed out. And it looks like he was not cut out to be a doctor. He discovered the pendulum, he discovered, he demonstrated that no one had ever seen in their history in 1851. People were amazed. I mean, how could he have so much knowledge and the earth was rotating? See, sometimes I remember in a university they ask, uh, uh, Dr. Einstein, how come we don't feel it? I said, yeah, that is a good and bad question because you are traveling with the earth. And they said, oh, Mr. Einstein is right. Galileo has one, you know, experiment. You are traveling with the ship, and then I am standing on the shore. And then if you drop something, I can see that thing is going parabolic almost. That is the thing. So because see, what Albert Einstein said, we don't feel it because all we are in the same frame of references. And then one of the most important ones in my idea was uh, Miss Emily de Chatelet. Oh, they were so rich. I mean, I don't know how true it is. Uh, she had seven servants. 
But of course she was not sissy, she was a good person and then unfortunately she died, was only 40 years old. But unfortunately, I mean, that scientist was so good and the combination of Sir Isaac Newton and Emily du Châtelet, we have the most important formula in the world. E is equal, I mean, EK is equal to uh, half mv square. That is the kinetic energy. Every time in our life we move forward, backward, to the sides, the kinetic energy is there. So, he, she came up with this formula, which is the most important kinetic energy we have in the wires, we have in, a, you know, boiling water, we have in the gases and everything else. But what I mean, Louis Pasteur was right. Her mind was prepared. And then one time, uh, you know, the husband, second husband, I mean the first husband was uh, always in to go and he was in army anyway. Second husband, Mr. Voltaire, was scientist. But unfortunately, he was always on the run because of the French government. They were after him to kill him. But, you know, he went to the Holland one time and then he saw an experiment and his name was Willem Grevesande. And uh, he proved that, you know, despite the public perception, if you drop a, you know, like a brass ball in a clay, if you increase the velocity double, it's not going to go double, it's going to go quadruple, so four times. So Mr. Volter came home and then tell uh, Emily this is what happened, and Emily knew. Her mind was prepared. She did it and then she realized that, you know, Mr. Gravasande was right. But before that they were thinking, if you have like, your velocity is one meter and then you do two meters, it's going to go two times. No, it's going to be four times. So back and forth, so many years I did it with Claire, I realized it's not a good idea. So finally I got the answer and then I got flowers. It was so good powder and then I had the steel balls and then I did it and it worked. When I increased that velocity double, my, steel, my ball, my, my steel ball went four times as much. So I'm glad they worked and these are the people who had no education. Well, my next one is more, uh, I have more for uh, uh, third part and then thanks a lot for watching and your feedback is so important I appreciate uh, you guys listen to this and then I'm hoping by the time I finish the third video you will learn a lot I mean these are simple laws of physics but what I mean in your ordinary life you encounter every day and then next time you see something like that and say ah this is the way so if you put something in a microwave it's because of the water that's why it's this hot. If there's no water in it, if you put just a, a glass, it's not going to get hot. It is, but not as good as the water does. So thank you for watching, and then I'm hoping, you know, uh, if your encouragement and then your support, you can email me, vahandavudyan at al.com, or, you know, uh, whatever you so that is great encouragement for me and because the feedback is so important in our life I remember when I was in electronic and that was something amazing they call it a feedback is not going to sustain no I mean oscillation will not sustain without the feedback there is a uh, circuit called tank circuit you know uh, is uh, you know, inductor and the capacitor. Back and forth, charge, recharge, charge, recharge, and then what they can do, they can do amazing things. That's called tank circuit. And that is the way they can sustain the oscillation. And then if they don't, so it's not going to work. So my feedback for you guys is that, you know, if you encourage me, if you tell me how it was, I would appreciate that. And then I'm hoping if you have any question, uh, don't worry about you ask me. If I don't, that, don't know that, I will go ahead and, uh, you know, just research it for you and then I will learn it and then I'll let you guys know. So you will never forget this. Thanks a lot for watching and appreciate it. Goodbye.